I mean, Bitcoin from inception has grown at 145% compound annually, and it's got a lower sharp ratio than any other asset. I mean, this is an amazing beast. It really is. So I, you know, but it's volatile and to some it's scary and I get all of that, but I've long contended that anybody who has zero of this is really, really missing the most asymmetric bet that I've ever seen in 40 plus years of making, trying to make asymmetric bets. Right. So, you know, to me, it's absolutely essential you must have how much of it you want to have, how much, you know, et cetera. Okay, that's up for debate. I get that. You know, people don't like the volatility. The volatility, by the way, though, it'll go down as time goes by. And it gets more widely distributed. Larry Leopard predicts that Bitcoin is going to hit $100,000 by 2024 before going on to hit $1 million and then on to $10 million. For those who don't know him, Larry Leopard is the managing partner and founder of Equity Management Associates, which has tens of millions of dollars under management. In his latest in this interview, Larry explains why investing in Bitcoin is one of the first times in human history that you can front run institutional money coming into an asset class. He believes this institutional capital is going to cause explosive price action for an asset that has a fixed supply. Keep in mind this is a sophisticated institutional grade investment fund founder speaking like this, which makes it clear to see the Bitcoin narrative is spreading. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video where I will break down Larry's outlook. Also guys, if you want to stay most up to date on the crypto world, I sent out a daily 5 minute crypto newsletter that covers expert predictions, on chain data breakdowns and breaking news all for free. Click the first link in the description, enter your email and join over 15,000 others to become a better crypto investor right now. Now here's Larry Leopard with his Bitcoin prediction. I recall quite clearly in that time frame that gold started moving in the 2019 time frame and Bitcoin didn't start moving until the 2020 time frame. Now having said that, when Bitcoin did move, it moved with great authority and it absolutely crushed the returns on gold. And as you know, and as you and I have discussed, I believe Bitcoin is the faster horse and a better long-term hold, but it's not for everybody because not everybody can tolerate the volatility. I mean, I have clients in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, and they don't want to have 70% drawdowns. And therefore I manage a fund that's both gold and silver and Bitcoin. But the point is that Bitcoin, you know, will get there and it will move. It'll move hard, but it tends to sometimes lag gold, or at least on the last couple of cycles, that's what I've observed. As you also know, I'm sure you'll point out that you know the ETF approval is a really big deal. I mean, notice how much it bounced just on the rumor. I mean, ETF approval will bring a lot of money into Bitcoin. And Michael Saylor does an excellent job of making point that it's very rare that you see an opportunity like this where you know there's a lot of money that's going to come by an asset, but it can't buy it today because, in fact, I was just talking to a very, very wealthy individual earlier today. I said, have you bought Bitcoin? Because I know I should, and I really want to, but I don't want to get a Trezor. I don't want to do cold storage. I don't trust myself to manage the keys. I don't want to put it on an exchange. I'm just waiting for the ETF. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think there are a lot of people who fall into that bucket. So yeah. Um, so that's where kind of Bitcoin is. You know, as everybody knows, or most people have listened to me know, I'm, I love them both. Okay. Gold is analog sound money proven 5,000 years old. You know, it was the best form of money that existed in the world until Bitcoin came along. And it is still less volatile than Bitcoin. And for some people, that's, that's a real advantage. They don't want to ride the up and down cycles within Bitcoin. Um, if you look at the actual characteristics of Bitcoin as money, and it is being adopted as money, in my opinion, it beats gold on just about every front. It's easier to store, it's easier to transfer, it's easier to verify, it's easier to divide, etc. And so I think when the people who set up the Bitcoin network, and I do think Satoshi was a group of people who then decided to go silent. I think I've met a few of them actually, but... Wow, well, I think it's a conversation for another time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, what are we talking about that? When the Bitcoin network got developed, something important was developed. And so, and sadly, a lot of gold people think, oh, all this crypto stuff is bullshit. And, and you know what? They're right. All crypto stuff is bullshit except Bitcoin. Because what Bitcoin did, what that system does and did is we created legitimate, provable digital scarcity. And before that time, that had never existed. So this is an invention. It's like when the Wright brothers created an airplane, they created a device that would allow human beings to go up in the air and travel. And, you know, from the Wright brothers to, you know, the Concord, you know, was a bunch of years, but it was amazing the developments that took place. And you might ask, well, why does digital scarcity matter? Digital scarcity matters because the most important characteristic of sound money is that it's scarce. And until gold, uh, until Bitcoin came along, gold was the element in the universe that was most scarce. You know, the supply only grew at one and a half percent a year. You know, it was verifiable. I mean, admittedly, you had to sometimes x-ray it so they didn't have tungsten inside it and had problems in verifying its purity. But, you know, suffice it to say there was no other element like gold. And that's why 6,000 years of evolution, it became kind of the preeminent form of money. Bitcoin, in my opinion, is really just digital gold 
with better characteristics. Now, it's not as widely distributed, it's not fully adopted, and there are two, as I've said before, to add credibility to the case, there are two weaknesses or two risks, and even big a Bitcoin advocate as Lynn will agree to these, and she writes about it in her book. There's the technical risk that in some way the network breaks or fails. I think based on who the core developers are, based on the fact that it's been working for 15 years, based on the technology involved, and, and so on and so forth, I think that risk has gotten to be very small. It was much larger before the block wars, before the hard forks, you know, in the early days, there were some backdoor problems, etc. I think, you know, 15 years in, the network is pretty damn robust and the risk of, of technical failure is low. Although that's why one, you know, I've often said, Greg Foss says, hey, Bitcoin is a CDS on the dollar. And I'm like, that's right. But gold is a CDS on Bitcoin. <laughs> So if Bitcoin fails, you want to have gold. I think the other risk to Bitcoin is that people just lose interest and it fades away. Money is really what we all agree is the most liquid good. And money has always been a ledger and Bitcoin is a ledger. And, you know, if for some reason people lost interest in it and stopped using it and didn't appreciate the qualities that it had, then, you know, OK, well, it would just it would kind of fade away. There's two other kind of knocks on it. One is that the governments are all going to outlaw it or two that, it, you know, and if we lose electricity in the Internet, it doesn't work. Well, if that's the case, we're back in the Stone Age. And I, I don't think, you know, the world is going to that place. And I don't think governments can stop it because it's really kind of robust in terms of its ability to, you know, thwart government, you know, attempts at, at grabbing and controlling it. So, but has it been in people's minds? Is it a safe haven? Well, in Bitcoiners' minds, it is. I mean, I think it's one of the safest assets out there. You know, it's also a lot easier to move and store. Try to take a billion dollars worth of gold from point A to point B. That's not easy. You need a jet. You, with 12 words, you can hop on an airplane and go to any place in the world, you know, and reestablish your Bitcoin wallet and you've got your wealth. So, you know, by the way, a lot of people in China were doing that in the early days of Bitcoin. It was being used for that. They had capital controls and they couldn't get out. So, you know. And in it, conflict, as, as terrible as it is, people need something that allows them to flee quickly. And again, we well, hope it doesn't right. get to this case but there are people that's that are already, correct. you know, having to evacuate, having to flee, you want something that you it's, can it's, take with you in an easy way. It's extremely portable wealth. I mean, you know what I mean? Obviously, if you were in Germany in the 30s and you wanted to get out, you know, having gold coins was really good because you could bribe border guards or whatever, use a travel expense. And I still say that. I mean, I think gold coins are very useful because, you know, there'll be people who probably won't accept Bitcoin when you got to pay bribe. But at the end of the day, I think Bitcoin is the superior form, will become the superior form of wealth. I also think, you know, both of these assets are going to increase in value significantly as paper money, fiat money gets debased and, you know, and, and destroyed. But you've got, you know, as Paul Tudor Jones says, Bitcoin's the fastest horse in the race. The reason for that is that it's got two things going on. It's got one, paper money is being destroyed. That's going to make gold go up, you know, because it's traditional money. And that's going to make Bitcoin go up. But two, it's got an adoption curve. And so we're just kind of past the Gladwell tipping point where, you know, 10 plus percent maybe of the developed world, you know, owns Bitcoin. And as we've all seen those adoption curves, you know, cell phone phones, radios, TVs, whatever it might be, any new innovation, it kind of tends to take the amount of time it took to get to the 10% as the amount of time right. it takes to get to 90%. I think in the next 15 years, Bitcoin is very likely to become the soundest reserve asset in the world. And if that's the case, and there are, you know, 8 billion people in the world, there are 21 million coins, I mean, the price per coin has got to go up a lot. One other thing I will say about Bitcoin that I think people don't understand, and this is part of the innovation that's really important. I think about Bitcoin's a commodity, right? The SEC said it's a commodity. It is a commodity. One coin is the same as the next. Okay, fine. Every commodity in the world, if you increase its price, supply goes up. If, if gold went to 10000 tomorrow, we'd mine more gold. If corn went up, if oil went to $300 a barrel, we'd drill for more oil. You would get more, higher price, you would get more. No matter where the price of Bitcoin goes, the issuance schedule is set. There's not going to be any more. It comes out, you know, every block is, you know, 6.25 coins right now, soon to be half of that. So, you know, it, that's unique. As a result of that, the world has never seen anything that really kind of looks like this, which is why, you know, it's, I mean, Ronnie Storfield had a great chart on the show. I mean, Bitcoin from inception has grown at 145% compound annually, and it's got a lower sharp ratio than any other asset. I mean, this is an amazing beast. It really is. And so, so I, you know, but it's volatile and to some it's scary and I get all of that, but I've long contended that anybody who has zero of this is really, really missing the most asymmetric bet that I've ever seen in 40 plus years of making, trying to make asymmetric bets. Right. So, you know, to me, it's absolutely essentially you must have how much of it you want to have, how much, you know, 
etc. Okay, that's up for debate. I get that. You know, people don't like the volatility. The volatility, by the way, though, it'll go down as time goes by and it gets more widely distributed. If we had sounder money, uh, some of the problems that exist in the world would not exist or they would be much less significant than they are today. So what I try to do through my podcasts and other things and my fun is advocate for people holding sounder money. Um, I think if we hold sounder money, it will then force the states to behave in a more responsible fashion, which will then mean states kill less people, which is something I think everyone could agree is a good goal. So, you know, and it goes beyond that. I think holding sound money also kind of protects one and that's a worthwhile goal. I mean, you know, I want to protect my kids. I want to protect kids that they haven't had yet. Someday be my grandkids. And so, you know, to me, those of us who, you know, look around at the world, see all the problems, you know, we can vote with our feet and say, all right, what are we going to do? I'm not president. I can't set the policies, but I can decide what I'm going to advocate for. And I'm going to support people that advocate for and believe in sound money, because I know that unsound money leads to, I think, government mischief that's not healthy for any of us. So that, that would be kind of my closing remarks. And I, and I think it, you know, it benefits you if, you if you're in a sound money. If you're in sound money investment, it's rocky. I mean, I'm, the last couple of years of my fund, I mean, I haven't had any fun. I mean, I had a couple of really great years in 19, 2019, 2020. And the last two years, I've been getting punched in the face. But I know that when you look at Lynn's chart, which will be in your, in your show notes, you can see that there's just no way out of this, but more inflation. And so sound money is the protective, is the thing you can do to protect yourself in that instance. So there's institutional investor Larry Leppard with his outlook on Bitcoin. His bold predictions coming from someone with such an established background in institutional investment is certainly turning heads in the crypto community. As Larry laid out, the influx of institutional capital into a fixed supply asset is the first time retail investors can front run the big boys. If Larry's insights spark your curiosity, remember my daily five minute crypto newsletter is your perfect ally in navigating the ever evolving world of cryptocurrency. By clicking the first link in the description, you can stay updated with expert forecasts, in-depth on-chain analysis, and the oddest crypto news. Anyway guys, hope you all enjoyed today's video and that provided you with some value. I'll see you all in the next one and as always, all the best. <laughs>